Welcome everyone. This is the first episode of our show, Reimagine, a Powered by Startup Bootcamp. And today we've got a very special guest, Josephine Tu, who is from Sophos Advisory and has, uh, you'll see it, she's got a little logo there in the corner. And we're <laughs> going to go through her journey and, uh, but more so we're going to talk about how growth is possible. You know, the reason, the premise of this show was really to try and get people in the right frame of mind and give everybody some strategies around how they can continue to innovate at this time and not be, you know, so focused in on everything that's going wrong. And so I'm very excited to, to chat with Josephine today because, you know, I, I, you know, I talked to you the other day, Josephine, and we yes. like, I was pumped. I was pumped <laughs> at the end. And I'm hoping I can do the same with our guest today. So can I quickly just go back and, 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 and uh, talk about your background because it's, it's really interesting and um, I love to just kind of set the context for, for the audience. Okay. Okay. Where do you want me to start? <laughs> oh, let, let, some question a little the, bit education. Someone, yes. Sorry. Too open-ended. From your education, let's say. Oh, okay. Education. I'm actually a civil structure engineer by training. So I, I am actually very problem oriented in terms of solving problem. I'm actually a structural engineer and you can see from my work, you know, I like to put structure around thinking and that's what my, I think my first love is. Yeah. I'm born in Malaysia. Actually, I grew up in Singapore and I've lived in five countries. I've lived in Germany. I think I've shared the story where I lived in Stuttgart for a few years. I've also lived in Shanghai and I was used to be in Melbourne and I just moved to Sydney. So don't blame me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, come on. We're gonna give we're gonna give the audience a little bit more than that. So I want to. So employee number one in Singapore for Infosys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my claim to fame is twenty years ago in two thousand when you know that was when people were thinking about Y two K. If you even think about it, two thousand was like everybody was afraid of Y two K. And uh, I I went from uh, a very infamous uh, company in a, in a valley called Science. I was employed at Science. And then there was a crash, dot-com crash in 2000. And then, uh, and then I was jobless. That was the point when I say sometimes you lose your job and it's a good thing. And I lost my job with this really sexy company in the US. And I was struggling with, oh, well, what the fuck am I going to do next and all that stuff. And then, uh, and then this company came knocking and it was this, Indian company at that time when I saw the email, I was like, what? You know, and uh, they, I mean, somebody referred me um, in the US and they were looking at starting the office in Singapore. So they came, the email came to say, hey, can you send me a resume? And I was like, I just, and I just like ignore it. I was like, I'm just gonna like ignore it, you know? Um, <laughs> who, are these, who are these people? <laughs> Why would I want to? And I just ignored it. And the guy was persistent. He was like, come back to me again. Can you please send me a resume? <laughs> okay, since I'm jobless, let me just give them my resume. You know what I mean? And it ended up, I did research on them. And I just like did serious research on the company. I can't find anything bad about them. Um, they were a listed company at that time already. Um, and they were looking for somebody to start the Singapore office. Um, so I started their office in Singapore and uh, the first thing they do is, okay, go to Funan Center and buy yourself a laptop and buy an air ticket to India. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I was fortunate enough, I, I have stock options as well. It's from the batch where we actually have stock options. So that was a claim to fame. Yeah. And I was the first Chinese actually to be, to be hired. Right. And, and, then, and then Germany was after Singapore? Yeah, yeah. So one of the, I was with them for six years. It was the scaling of 100 million to a billion journey in six years. Um, I closed one of the, uh, the first sort of SAP end to end implement, implementation deal for Asia Pacific. Uh, and that was with a client named Daimler Chrysler, which owned Mercedes at the time. Um, and, uh, and we closed the deal. It was a great, and, um, they asked me to go to Germany. So I went to Germany in Stuttgart, the car capital. So the sad thing is I'm not a big car person. So it's really wasted on me. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And you couldn't speak German. Ich ein bisschen Deutsch. Only, only a little bit. Yeah. I didn't really have time to study, although they paid for my tuition and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and you yeah well, well you know, we'll get into those interesting board board conversations another time but so this kind of led you know your your early um, all the you know the learnings you took from these companies and the scaling of these companies in such a rapid time that it kind of led into a, a advisory kind of consulting work. Uh, 
I um I mean like obviously that scaling you know like six years and then uh, I I we we exited the company when the stock the uh, stock option uh, finished um and I did try my hands on you know uh, starting or, or building a company with some ex colleague which resulted in some really bad failure as well so I've gone through the bad failure where I've lost money uh, and all uh, burn out lost money when on the soul searching trip. Um, and, uh, and then the last role I had was with a group company where bought, which they bought group com- they bought companies that are uh, built up by entrepreneurs like 3, mi- 3 million, 15 million, 50 million kind of size and then I worked with them to scale the company so that, that's what um, I, I did in a previous role and I decided to start my own. Yeah well no, no entrepreneur journey is complete without a couple of failures that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, and then now, look. Let's get let's dig into some of this. Um, you know what what brought us here today, and I'm just going to touch on a, on a few points, and then you know feel free to comment as you as you go. Um, you know what really stuck out to me when we had our first chat. You know, and I wrote the note, and I kind of I've been I've been preaching it by the way since since we yeah I've been sending people the video. I'm like an ambassador, um, but the idea that like. Um, thinking to think about growth at this time and not survival. That's just kind of like it was the thing where really kind of you know struck me. And 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 just that one line is enough to just talk to people right now that are going through what it is, whatever it is, that they it can kind of switch them into a different mindset like so quickly. So I want to kind of get into the the background of um, of the you know the you know, the strategy and and the concepts that you've created in the and and um, and what you you know you're, you're preaching you're teaching right now, but can I start with um, the concept of buka because I think this is a, a good starting point, and I think a lot of people are in this headspace. So what is buka? I think VUCA is actually um, a, mil- a military term uh, um, uh, uh, or something. So VUCA is a V for volatility, U for uncertainty, C for complexity, and A for ambiguity, right? So this is like the environment that we are operating in. And what happened is that when we are in a VUCA environment, we tend to, as human beings, shrink because we want to feel safe, so we contract and we hesitate or become cautious. And that's what a lot of companies and people are in right now. They're in that state because the VUCA environment is creating that contraction state, right? And I think one of the key things uh, of this environment that's a little bit different is that there is chaos on all levels and in all aspects of our lives. You know, it is health and wealth and social life, business and economies, trade and geopolitics, and then community and civil society that's happening in terms of unrest. So it's a bit like, man, the chaos is and and it's happening in all aspect of our life. And it really create and heighten a uh, VUCA environment. And that's where you know everybody is going through right now. And that's why we're all very tired because cognitively we are dealing with that overload of change and information and renewal. And everybody is finding themselves to be extra tired, extra exhaustion to deal with all the change. And to, you know, to add to that, right, this makes it hard for a lot of companies to be thinking about innovation, to be thinking about growth, correct? Yes, it is. So the, the smart one and the one that realized is that because it's creating this kind of environment for everybody, the one that is smart enough to actually really understand that this is an opportunity for one, for the one that can actually think clearly, get the clarity, get the people together motivated, and set up the system to execute on it, um, will gain from it. So that's what it is. So you've also got, you know, this kind of, um, Emotional agility, the concept of emotional agility is in there, the concept of motivation equation. How much, um, can you talk a little bit about the psychology of, of what's going on now? So I think emotional agility is um, uh, is a book. You check out the book by Susan David. And make sure I want to credit uh, the people. Uh, yeah, cool. She's the one that coined the term uh, emotional agility. Uh, one of the, obviously she's a TED, TED, uh, TEDx, a TED uh, talk speaker. And um, it's, I think what is, has been heightened is that because of all this condition that's happening around us, a lot of us are feeling all this big string of emotions on a daily basis, right? And then it, again, depending on what kind of personality and character that you have, some people are pretty 
detach from their feelings and emotion and some people are really you know in touch with it right so for those that are even a little bit detached as human beings we will feel this you know emotion that's arising in us and sometimes emotion need to be i think classified not not be judged as good or bad but just emotions and i think a a a, a lot of teachings sometimes we could classify emotion and bad and we sort of try to suppress it but mm-hmm. actually if you look at the, the the emotion agility it is actually not to judge our emotions as good as bad it is just an emotions that is actually arising is in us and we will experience this given the times that we are in because a lot of people are experiencing a lot of loss and grief. So that's a part of the emotion that's arising in us. And in order to be taking action, we actually need to process these feelings and emotions. So it's important to have the emotional agility. And the steps, you know, as we have highlighted, is that the first thing is that you need to sort of acknowledge that and not be in, not denying it and not suppressing it. Because once you feel it and bring an awareness to it, then you can start to process it and recognize it uh, and then not to judge it. Uh, and it's, it's not only just to ourselves, right? Because if you look at people around us, I think we are seeing a lot of friends, family members, colleagues behaving out of work that they're not their normal selves. Like a lot of us are not in our normal selves because we're going through all these changes. So it's about having that compassion and kindness towards other people and towards ourselves because we will probably be also having some bad behaviors because we're acting out from those feelings. And if you don't acknowledge those feelings, you probably act them out. Um, So you need to acknowledge it and then you need to actually uh, uh, be kind and not blame it. And then you actually have to check in what's underneath those feelings, you know, uh, what's going on underneath. Is it because I'm in denial of the business? Is it because I'm not happy with certain things? So once you understand why you're feeling this way, you can then quickly flip to tuning into what's important to you because you need to bring yourself to that so-called positive space of reminding yourself what is important, what is it essential, what is the vision and, 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 and things that I value that's really important to me, important to me. tune into that uh, so that you'll bring you into a good space and then understand what is the next steps I need to take to move myself towards the thing that is important. Yeah, and look, I, I, I've got to believe this is, has to be like a little bit amplified in entrepreneurs, right? Because I just, I just, you know, I, you know, I had, had, a, had a chat with a friend, AJ, and, and then the ability now to almost, you know, where, you know, I'm in my garage when I'm not, you know, not in the office or I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in a space and I'm kind of isolated and I have the ability to like, you know, work 20 hours a day if I want, right? There's like, and, and, and entrepreneurs always kind of seem to, um, and innovators, we're talking more and more about innovators today, um, seem to burn the candles and then kind of we get ourselves in this time warp and we're tired and, and you know, so um, yeah, definitely getting into, uh, I, I call it matrix territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, you talk about the whole motivation thing as well, right? I mean, look yes, at the motivation yes. equation, right? I think you need to understand when you are busy and you are stretching yourself, are you actually also trying to distract yourself? Because, you know, you could be very busy being active, busy, but you're always, you might not be really doing anything that's really sort of productive and beneficial or really moving your business forward as well. And actually do, you know, that feeling of compulsion to want to be busy sometimes could also be something that uh, people are doing to, to not to feel what's really going on. You know, it's like um, a procrastination. I'm sure you know, but procrastination is actually a form of, uh, is, is a way that people are using to actually de-stress themselves. Um, so, so it's interesting, like if you say busy, are you busy doing real work or are you busy just being, you know, trying to distract yourself? So that's like a key differentiation, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think this is kind of happening in companies too, right? Because, um, you know, the, the, the idea of the remote work situation as well is that, you know, I, I, I was on this remote work productivity conference and, uh, you know, one of the experts there was saying, look, um, productivity is, is you know, you know, 
is very it's very good with remote teams and stuff. And they go, there's some re the, one of the reasons he he gave was that like you know I've got to meet my boss again on Friday, and I feel like I need to have done this this and this. The reality is maybe I could have only done three of the five things, but to like make sure that I got you know somewhere meaningful by the next time we talk. I'm putting in those extra hours and stuff, and um, and um, and with the with the isolation thing, we're kind of blurring the lines between, you know, work and home. But let, I don't want to stick too much on the on the psychology. But let's get into um, growth growth trends. Now I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Yeah. So I wanted to I wanted to first I wanted to give people's attention to the fact that look, all right, we are a little bit in our heads at this time, and. And maybe that's a folk, you know, uh, uh, preventing us from doing the best we can in terms of innovation, managing our teams, managing our own time and productivity, and thinking the big picture because we're kind of, you know, blinkers on on on, on you know what we think is important right now and not not um, kind of uh, seeing the big picture or the you know the the the, the categories as, as you talk about. But what are what are some of the growth trends that have been accelerated? And then we'll jump into growth markets at this stage because I want to, you know, I want to highlight the fact that this some in markets and some uh, businesses that are doing incredibly well right now. So I mean, like the first question to ask is whether the trend was accelerated and then uh, reinforced. The second question to ask is really, are you seeing what I call a, a secondary level of product and services that is arising to meet the first wave? A real growth market actually expands and it deepens and it has first and second waves of products that actually uh, uh, create ultimately an ecosystem. That's how a real market grow and expand. That's the characteristic of it, right? So if you look at, you know, digital retail and uh, uh, future of work, which is more mature trend, you tend to see like the first wave of uh, sustainable uh, convenience consumption, for example. The first wave that happened, that drive is last mile logistic because, you know, all this thing about instant demand, instant delivery, you know, if we don't have alcohol, call Jimmy because Jimmy will deliver, you know, we are so lazy now. That's what consuming convenience consumption is. Is, right it actually drove the growth of last last mile logistic which is parcel delivery right i mean as you said ronnie chang said you know if you want a <laughs> pen you can order on amazon just to deliver one pen you know you know that's, that's what it. happened and that is obviously the first wave also had the mobile and social buying uh, as well as digital payment the second wave then you see uh, to support the first wave um, as I'm aware that there was one developer in Melbourne uh, that actually uh, are building uh, smart lockers for delivery, right? So they are seeing that uh, a lot of people that live in apartments will need that because there are so many deliveries happening 24 by 7. Um, and digital identity is going to be important because there's more consumption happening, you know, digitally. Uh, who you are, who you say you are, it's going to be important. As well as we are seeing all the uh, cyber security, you know, uh, and scam, you know, happening uh, because you know there's a lot of uh, lax uh, um, uh, security uh, around, and with more digital buying, you will need actually better payment. So you know, flexible payment, cross-border payment that's cheaper, uh, as you can see in uh, Afterpay and Air Wallets, uh, all the companies that's coming up to solve all this problem. Um, what you know, what was also interesting that you also pointed out the uh, you know these. Uh, Markets that were ballooning, or this kind of artificial, you know, this this spike in demand, and that people think, all right, well, this is, but it's actually, you know, this is a, a growth or a trend here, but it's actually not, right? With you know, uh, you know, the, the purchase of toilet paper, for example, right? You're going to have a massive <laughs> spike, but it's going to tailor off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I was trying to get people to understand first what, what a growth market normally looks like. And then if you apply it to, okay, let's look at, you know, because I think uh, during uh, COVID, a lot of people say, oh, wow, this demand, we have seen this demand spiking and growing, you know, this categories are increased, you know, everybody's buying uh, a screen top and uh, bunning, uh, what office workers, you know, really experiencing the demand. So I think that question was, you know, uh, my question, I think I was trying to answer was, what are the ones that are actually real and what are the ones that was really spiked? And I think um, I, I, we showed that, you know, uh, an example of what a spike is will be a toilet paper or cleaning products because these are actually quite stable. If you think about what generate demand, these are quite stable demand. It's not like we have a spike in 
population that increased the need of use of toilet paper. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. there is a reason why a growth market grow because the increase in usage, right? But if you look at this behavior of cleaning and toilet paper, it is something that's a spike that will go down as you know, obviously the whole because COVID situation set it down. But if you look at um, an, an example of a meal, a meal kit delivery company, which is HelloFresh or a Mali Spoons, um, they actually fit into that three key trends of health and wellness, convenience consumption in terms of retail, and then uh, into working from home. So this key, three key trends that was accelerated is actually providing the tailwind uh, for this category to really grow. And of course, they experience a big spike in demand during the lockdown phase. But we also say that, you know, as we come out of, you know, the ease of uh, uh, restriction, there's going to be a drop in the demand because, I mean, I don't know about you. I know you can't in Victoria, but I can, you know, to go out to eat in cafe. And therefore, I would really want to go and eat instead of cooking another home cooked meal. So that would drop in, you know, demand a little bit. But eventually, it is a growing market, and a growing market will actually lift all boats. And all these companies that are in these categories will experience a grow in demand compared to a toilet paper, you know, from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So the ideal situation is if to have a product right there, it's like got growing right now, but it's in a growth market. That's the ideal situation, right? Yeah. But, but we, in analysis, actually, they've shown that you could also be in a growing market, but your market is actually completely restricted and hibernated because of COVID, which yeah. is where there is a difference. Um, you have, I mean, like I said, you know, anybody in the travel sector would have a complete collapse because of the restriction, right? Uh, or even a, a specific kind of restaurants, you know, that has a growing need because of the restriction, they are actually restricted in terms of the market or collapse. So the demand would have dropped. But the difference is that when the, when the restriction are actually eased, you know, the, the demand will sort of resume compared to some market that's actually in the process of decline. And some of them could be where because of the COVID situation, it might accelerate the decline. Yeah, no, no good. But I remember, I remember one of the one of the you know, the hibernating uh, examples you had was uh, adventure travel, right? Yeah. And because that's you know there was definitely a, a growth in in terms of you know uh, people wanting more of an experience when they travel and and more and more niches because I travel and I want to learn how to do jujitsu when I travel and go to Brazil, whatever. So um, so in in that in those circumstances, a, a business is just hanging on, or we're, we're still trying to innovate. In the meantime, given we don't know what time it resumes back to, what is the advice on companies stuck in hibernation? Yeah, yeah. So we cover right, like the different kind of market, whether you're growing, stable, or declining. But actually, if you think about it, regardless of this, growth is possible. If you are in a growing market, you know you can grow faster uh, than your uh, peers. You can grow faster than your than the market. If you're in a stable market, you can grow by gaining market share. In a declining market, you know, you can grow by consolidating in the market and create a new engine for growth. So the key difference is that the ones that actually grow differently compared to everybody else in the market is that they do something different. You have to do something different, and that's really key. And in here, in this climate now, you actually need to leverage what you have. You need to write the trends, make those big bets you need to decide on what those big bets are and make this strategic bold move. And that's what you need to do. You need to do something different where you make those strategic bold moves that's different to the market and different to what everybody else is doing. Can we, can we dig a bit deeper on that example? Because this like is, you know, kind of classic innovation, I suppose, as startup bootcamp would teach it, right? It's like, the, uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Puck from, from memory, right? Is it, they, they Puck, brought, yeah. Yeah, they, they're trying a bunch of experiments. They're looking at the data. They're testing a bunch of stuff. And then they, they eventually they get to a point where they go, hey, hang on, this one's working a little bit. Let's kind of double down. And then um, we're off to the races, right? That's pretty much what they did. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what they did. So they, they obviously the first thing, uh, the logical thing to do the first time is just, okay, let's do takeaway. 
right? I mean, like, because the key thing is that since the people are not coming to us, you know, let's just, you know, shift to takeaway. But that's not enough because um, the 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 climate the climate has the, the climate has changed because if you just do takeaway same fine dining menu shift to the takeaway just doesn't make sense you know for people nobody's gonna number one pay so much money for a takeaway and it doesn't fit fine dining is the experience of fine dining right like, what do I do takeaway in my scallop you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just like wow eating scallop with plastic you know that's not gonna be very fine dining. So, I mean, it's, that's where I call the inconsistent pivot, right? I mean, so therefore, they actually need to shift. Obviously, you can't get people to pay $69, you know, so the pricing also has to be readjusted to fit, you know, the kind of spending that people will be willing to pay for in, in this climate. So they play with the menu. They actually change the menu itself. They try different way of saying, like, the theme of fried chicken Thursday. They they, they play with it and then they realize, oh, fried chicken Thursday was very, very, very popular, you know? So they make it like a theme of a promotion of fried chicken. They play with cocktails and drinks and experiment with it, you know? Uh, 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 that was another way that they experiment. They played with other new business model or new business product. Uh, I think they create a home shopping, uh, home shopping where they actually sell air fryer because obviously Wolfgang was a big personality uh, uh, and he's a renowned chef. Um, he 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 also played with you know the virtual cooking class, right? A lot of chef now has moved to like virtual cooking class. But the key beauty is that they 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 really sit with the 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 strength of of what they have. So he used virtual cooking class combined with meal kit delivery combined with drinks so that they jack up the price at least you know the entire price or you know of the meal kit is hundred and fifty dollars compared to you know just you know HelloFresh would be probably uh, thirty dollars uh, for one meal delivery right. So it's like how do you play with what is your strength or what you're good at uh, as an asset, which is his personality, you know, and his brand, you know, create a virtual cooking class, have the ingredients prepared and delivered, have the drinks to jack up the price so that it's a bit fine dining at home. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so that's like where you experiment and play with the formula so that it fits you, you know, as a company. Absolutely. Uh, and then, so the, the, the model, well, the concept of um, you had of defend, stabilize, offensive, and thrive. Can you just run through that a little bit for me? Um, I think that came from, um, I think the phase one where we were going through uh, in the beginning, most company when this whole COVID started was really just trying to be in the defending themselves of uh, preparing that the employees are safe, you know, moving you know, into a COVID operation environment, shifting into a remote environment uh, of how do you still work. So they were really, you know, in the, you know, trying to, uh, they were actually coming from a defense and then they were trying to stabilize themselves financially of looking at their cash flow, you know, can we still operate in this environment? What kind of loans we might need, grants and all that, you know, initiative. And people have gone through that process, reducing your rent, reducing all your expenses. I think most companies has, you know, did, you know, gone through that phase. So um, the next stage really is look at how can we grow, which is really the offense, you know, like how can we grow in this climate? Because I think that the next two years, people are going to realize, you know, that things are going to get a little bit difficult, you know, the environment that we're operating in. Um, but you can't, I call it, you can't, you can't save money. You can't optimize and play safe in order to grow. You know, to grow, you have to play offense, you know, you, know it's not, you can't play defense to win, basically. You know, there's no such thing. So you actually need to shift into an offensive mode and actually try to aim high because we have a few year period, you know, that you have to work through. You need to aim high and actually works towards growth and actually make those strategic ball move towards it uh, uh, in order to thrive when we come out of this, maybe in a couple of years time, right? Uh, that create also a new sense of focus because if you don't aim high and 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 make those big bets, um, uh, maybe you know you, you you might not be left standing because if you aim high, um, you might be safe at the end of the day. But if you try to play safe, you might not be standing <laughs> in the two years time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know this. I love this. So I want to you know I want to 
dig a bit deeper, right? Because this, I think this is where a lot of companies are probably right now, right? In the, in the kind of, you know, everything that's going on, you know, I mean, Melbourne, you know, Victoria's had a little bit different because we're, we're ready to go again. And then, you know, back, back, back behind closed doors. But the, 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 the point in time now where we can think about growth, not just stabilizing, not just survival, and to your point, thriving, how do we, how, how do we start that journey? How do we, how do we, how do we get moving? How do we, to get the, our teams motivated to think like that? How, how, how does this work with you guys, at, at, you know, to, to get this conversation started? And, and yeah. think I find that um, when people are distracted with what's coming in front of them immediately, that's where they get stuck. Because I think when you, the way to take a blinders on actually is good with the thing, reimagine. I think to take the blinders on, you know, is that you get them to reimagine, hey, you know, like you reimagine, hey, in three years time, actually one thing that I do with the clients is I say, okay, in three years time, okay, um, if I ask you, you might appear in AFR. Okay, reimagine that you are going to be interviewed in AFR and you are successful. You have thrived. Let's use the word thrive. You have thrived and actually become really successful right? What does that look like? And what would that be? What will you be called? What will, what will be the statement that define you, right? So if you put some time between you now and put some time, say, let's say three years. So when you pull people back and say, look through all three years and aim high, what does that look like? You know, yeah. then you shift the mindset to now, which they're so stuck in, you know, forward and move it up high and say, so what does that success look like where you are thriving for that word? What would you look like? What would the company look like? You know, what is that, what is that statement? What is that position, right? That's when they will start to, you know, expand, you call it, right? And refocus on something further. And with time, you know, it's possible. It creates that possibility. Then people say, oh, okay, and true is time. Is that possible? Yeah, anything can happen from now to three years. The only difference is what choice you're gonna make now, what you're gonna do now, you know? Yeah. So that's where sort of it create that space and the expansion to reimagine what could be. But I think that there is another layer now that I feel people need to put in the filter because I think that with COVID that has triggered this change that is going on in the world, even those that had a vision a year ago I feel that most people should really look at their vision and check in and see, is this still relevant and valid for us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a great, great place to end. I want, you know, everyone hyped up thinking about the future, reverse engineering, all those dreams. Uh, thank you very much, Josephine. Uh, how does everybody, how's everybody at home find you? Sorry, How does everyone I'm find not... you? So oh, close advisory. I'm I'm trying, to, trying to give you a plug here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, feel free to connect on LinkedIn, obviously. And um, obviously, uh, sophos.com.au, you know, that's where you can find me. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We'll be back, hopefully, weekly, talking to best innovators from across Australia and around the world so we can keep you inspired during this time, thinking about success and to Josephine's point, thinking about growing. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Keep growing. <laughs>